I would like you to welcome to today's Out of Friday session. We're going to try something new. And I thank you all for supporting our early career researchers. So this afternoon, we're going to have a contributed session with Alba de las Heras Munoz and Dr. Emil Zak. Alba is going to be the first. And this session has been organized in the sense that we are going to have a lot of beautiful and twisted things. We're going to hear about vortices and about um, centrifuge, uh, optical centrifuge. Our next speaker, Dr. Emil Zak, he received his PhD in theoretical physics in 2017 from University College London under the supervision of Professor Jonathan Tennyson. And uh, Emu's research covered theoretical rotational vibrational and rotational vibrational electronic spectroscopy of triatomic molecules. After completing his PhD, he became a postdoctoral fellow at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada, where he worked with Tucker Carrington on the computational methods development in quantum dynamics of molecules. Most recently, he was a research associate at the Center for Free Electron Laser Science uh, in the Deutsches Elektronen Synchroton Desi in Hamburg, Germany. And as a member of the Controlled Molecule Imaging Group, he conducted calculations of ultrafast dynamics of molecules in laser fields. And Emil's present research aims to uncover the dynamical aspects of chirality emerging at the other second time scales. So he simulates interactions of chiral molecules with chiral electromagnetic fields. So we're gonna have a lot of twists today. And he will talk about controlling rotation in the molecular frame with an optical centrifuge. So Emil, feel free to start, we're ready to go. Thank you, I, I hope you can hear me well. We are good. Okay. Uh, uh, Firstly, many thanks uh, to Carla and the Atto Fridays team for uh, giving me a chance to, to give this talk today. Um, a little update, uh, I am no longer affiliated with DZ uh, nor CPEL. Uh, however, a big part of the results that I'm going to show you today uh, have been produced during my stay in the Controlled Molecule Imaging Group so a lot of credit goes to my theory team colleague, uh, Andrei Yachminev, and to the head of the CMI group, uh, Johan Cooper. Uh, but now moving on to rotating molecules. Um, classical objects can rotate about any axis, and vast majority of molecules are asymmetric tops. And on the screen here, we can see an example of an asymmetric top object, which has three distinct principal inertia axes marked with A, B, and C. As it turns out, uh, stable rotation is only possible about the largest moment of inertia axis and the lowest, the lo lowest mom smallest moment of inertia axis, so C and A, uh, while rotation about the intermediate moment of inertia axis, B axis is unstable. And we'll come to that later. Um, molecules, however, are small enough objects that quantum laws apply to their motions. And quantum description of molecular rotations operates with discrete rotational states rather than a specific axis of rotation. And these states, are labeled with J, which is the total angular momentum, and its projection onto uh, the laboratory frame Z-axis, uh, labeled with M. And such asymmetric top states can be expanded in the basis of symmetric top wave functions. And for each J, uh, there are two J plus one distinct energy levels, and they are enumerated with gamma. Uh, and each of these levels have uh, usually different properties in the molecular frame. And one such property uh, which on, on, on which we might build our intuition uh, is uh, the expectation value of uh, the components of the molecular frame angular momentum. Uh, and as it turns out, 
if we pick the highest possible energy level for each given value of J, marked here with red, uh, what we find out is that the molecular frame angular momentum here, it's almost perfectly aligned with the A axis. Uh, what does it mean? It means that there's almost certainty that our axis of rotation will be aligned with the A axis. Uh, therefore, we can assign these states, these states a label A and uh, call them principal rotation states. Uh, it also means that uh, the K quantum number, which uh, sets the projection of the angular momentum onto the molecular frame Z axis is nearly a good quantum number. And uh, so in this sense, we can only discuss uh, probabilities of finding the nuclei in space or the probabilities of uh, finding the axis of rotation in space. Uh, and in this manner, we can confirm that these states indeed uh, represent molecules which mostly rotate about the A-axis by uh, doing Monte Carlo uh, sampling of the wave function. And here is uh, one such sample. Uh, this is H2S molecule, hydrogen sulfide. And uh, such a simulation shows that indeed the molecule rotates about the A-axis, uh, no wonder. And similar situation occurs uh, for uh, the lowest possible energy levels for each J, uh, where the average value of the C component of the angular momentum uh, is, 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 dominates here. So we can assign a label C to these states. Uh, whereas there are also states lying in the middle of the energy spectrum. And uh, for these states, the leading component of the angular momentum is B. So here now we have B. And the more red it is, the more dominant this component is. Uh, so all these th three situations shown in previous slides are combined in one image here, where this color coding uh, marks the, these relative magnitudes of molecular frame angular momentum uh, and respective probability densities for one select, selected state for each uh, type of principal rotation states is plotted here. So we have A, B, and C states, A, B, and C. Uh, and the challenge now is to populate these states. Uh, it can be done uh, with the use of an optical centrifuge. Uh, an optical centrifuge is uh, a linearly polarized pulse in which uh, the polarization plane rotates around the propagation direction of the pulse. And this rotation accelerates over time uh, and thus giving it a corkscrew shape. Uh, and the molecule interacts with this centrifuge pulse via the electronic polarizability. And it experiences a series of Raman transitions with delta J equal to two. So it climbs up the ladder. Uh, and what we discovered is that uh, a slowly accelerating centrifuge, pu centrifuge pulse favors energy excitation along this lowest path. Uh, and it's quite in contrast to a fast centrifuge where the acceleration rate is high. Uh, such a scenario favors the, the, the topmost levels. Uh, so it follows uh, the path leading to the population of this A principal rotation states. Uh, so the angular momentum from the field is being injected into the molecule. And depending on how fast or slow the centrifuge accelerates, we populate the C principal rotation states or A principal rotation states. Uh, one important thing here is that uh, the centrifuge pulse is characterized by the acceleration rate beta. This is to know for the future. And uh, field envelope F and also field strength. We will need that in a bit. Uh, so we calculated the total populations of 
uh, the A and C principal rotation states for H to S uh, at the end of the centrifuge excitation pulse. And on the horizontal axis here, you can see the field strength. And on the vertical axis is the acceleration rate of the centrifuge, beta. And the color codes uh, denote the cumulative populations of the C states here and A states here. And it's quite apparent that uh, when the centrifuge accelerates slowly, so for low beta values, uh, the C excitation path dominates. Uh, in, and the situation is reversed when we move to higher values of acceleration rates. Uh, and this is more clearly seen in a differential plot where we subtract the total populations of A states minus uh, total population of C states. Uh, and so now, for instance, picking a set of centrifuge parameters uh, marked with this uh, triangle here. Uh, and if we plot the probability of finding the rotation axis, we discover that indeed this axis of rotation aligns with the A-axis. Uh, if we pick uh, a circle here with low values of acceleration rate, uh, we find out that the molecule rotates about the C-axis. Uh, a truly interesting thing occur when we pick beta values somewhere in the middle, and uh, like this white square here, uh, then the molecule is in fact coherently rotating about two different axes at the same time. Uh, and this type of behavior is quite universal across all near oblate asymmetric top systems. Here we have similar maps, but for a much bigger 2H imidazole molecule. And qualitatively, both H2S and imidazole uh, respond to these varying acceleration rates uh, the same way. Uh, so to, to wrap up what we've learned so far, uh, I would in inspect this slow versus fast transition again uh, yet from another angle. Uh, here on the left, you can see the probability for finding the hydrogen nuclei uh, in a specific state. Uh, it's a coherence between J12 and J14, uh, C principal rotation states created with optical centrifuge. And here are the probabilities for finding the A axis and C axis in the laboratory frame. And such a coherence produces moving probability density for the nuclei and this speed of rotation is constant. It's a classical like rotation. Uh, on the other end for fast centrifuge, uh, we have the same situation, but the molecule rotates about the A axis. And again, if we pick some, some intermediate value uh, of the acceleration rate, uh, we get coherence where uh, the molecule indeed rotates about two axes at the same time. It's a simultaneous rotation. Uh, if we carried on uh, with the centrifuge pulse, with proper timing of this pulse, it is possible to create also pure stationary states where the probability density is time independent and doesn't rotate. Uh, so we can create these two types of states. Uh, and what comes to my mind is that what we are describing here is actually a quantum version of a pretty popular classical experiment in which you uh, take an egg and spin it. And when you apply a little force to it, it's gonna rotate on its side. Uh, however, if you apply a little bit more force, it is going to spin on its tippy end. Uh, the only difference here is that eggs cannot really rotate about two different axes at the same time while our molecules can. Uh, so this is the analogy. Mm. So to, to summarize all this, if we put these principal rotation states as vertices of a triangle, we are able to tune the coherence between these two states or uh, produce a mixture of these two state, states by tweaking the acceleration rate of the centrifuge. So we can move along this line. 
And here I'd like to give a big shout out to Alec Owens, who a few years back also uh, had some ideas about this and produced a brilliant paper on a technique for controlling this axis of rotations as well, of rotation as well. Uh, so check out his paper. Uh, so this is our situation. We can produce C states, A states, and essentially arbitrary coherences between them. Uh, and the nice thing is that it's possible to find a measure which takes in on one end uh, the parameters of the molecule like rotational constants, polarizabilities, and on the other end, the parameters of the field, acceleration rate, uh, field strength, etc., and combine them together into a single measure. Uh, I call this measure spinability vector. And this vector really maps these parameters onto the composition of the A plus C wave packet. Uh, so we can sort of predict what will be the composition given the molecule and the field parameters. So uh, the pending question here is, what about the B states? Well, they are quite peculiar. Uh, and this is somewhat related to the phenomenon first observed in space. Uh, where an object like the one you can see in the video here is uh, shows a pretty sinister, uh, to put it lightly, behavior, uh, where the orientation of it flips periodically in free space. And this is called the Japanikov effect or uh, the tennis ra racket effect. Uh, and, and it's pretty mind boggling. Uh, but this is also reflected in, in, in the quantum world. Uh, the B. So the intermediate axis states are present. Uh, however, they are usually dark in a sense that they are not connected to the rotational ground state. And more to that, they also lie very close together with all other states, this high density of states, and there's high chance for chaos, even in quantum sense. So in order to reach these states, we have to design a path that will excite specific transitions. And we can do that by modulating uh, the field envelope. So what we did, we raised the field strength whenever uh, we want the transition to happen and drop it elsewhere. So the resulting pulse is like a train of centrifuge pulses. Uh, we did simulations of time-dependent Schrodinger equation. We solved it for, uh, for this molecule and for this type of pulses. Here you can see this field envelope of optical centrifuge. And in the top, you see time profiles of populations of these B states or B principal rotation states. Uh, and what we observe is that indeed we end up in a pure B rotation state. So it's possible to do. And by adjusting uh, the centrifuge pulse duration, we can also leave the molecule in a coherent superposition of two adjacent uh, B states. Here is J12 and J10. And as we might remember, such a coherence produces cogwheel-like rotation of probability density. Uh, so to sum up, uh, it's possible to create stationary states, uh, which are principal rotation states, A, B, or C. Uh, we can produce coherences between J and J plus two states. Uh, but quite surprisingly, if we study uh, coherences with more than two states, uh, something quite remarkable happens. Uh, in such a case, uh, despite one axis being strongly aligned in the molecular frame and in, in the laboratory frame as well, there are quantum beatings in the plane perpendicular to this axis. Uh, and I took the pleasure of uh, giving these states a, a working name of slinky states, because they kind of sort of remind me of slinky, where you have this little slinky going on, and there are like recurrences of pressure wave going around this. Uh, so we expect that there will be recurrences of coherence in this plane on top of this 1D alignment. After we derive analytically uh, the expectation value of the cosine of this angle, it's called the alignment cosine, 
we see that indeed it looks like there should be quantum revivals of probability density of finding nuclei in space in this xy plane. Uh, and we are going to show, uh, just to confirm it, how, how it looks in, in, in numerical practice. Uh, so here again, we have a general slinky state where uh, it's a linear combination of uh, principal rotation states with lambda and lambda can be A, B or C. And notably, it has pretty simple uh, form as well. So they are pretty, pretty simple states due to confinement in space. And now if we calculate this alignment cosine uh, for lambda equals a, b, or c, so for these three, three different types, what we see is that the alignment cosine, which measures the deviation of the molecular axis from this z-axis of the labor laboratory frame, is very high. It means that the molecule is strongly aligned in 1D, and the angular momentum is strongly aligned in 1D. Uh, and the other, the, the red one, the red cosine, is exactly the cosine square phi, uh, which measures uh, this you know, recurring alignment in, in the xy plane. And we do indeed see recurrences of pretty high alignment for a very, very short period of time. So there are instances of very brief 3D alignment uh, on top of uh, almost gyroscopic, very high orientation of the angular momentum. Uh, and we can do it for A states, B states, and C states. Uh, and these types of states are closely related to uh, something called transients. And uh, these transients have been very well summarized in a seminal paper from Peter Felker. Uh, where you can see the C type and A type transients, but I couldn't find any anything about the B type transients, and this is probably be because uh, you know uh, these states were considered pretty uh, bizarre and and they were uh, they were uh, hard to access and nobody cared about them. But now it is it is at least possible uh, to think about achieving these uh, producing these transients, so we can introduce another type, the B-type uh, transient with different set of selection rules. Uh, so what we discussed so far is no less than sample preparation. And we cannot get away without imaging, uh, imaging the states that we have prepared. Uh, so in a typical 1D or 3D molecular alignment experiment, we have a single camera essentially we shot a molecule from a single camera. Mm. And even though the molecule is aligned in 3D, we get direct access to see it from only one side. Uh, on the other hand, if we were able to realize the slinky states uh, with quantum beatings, mm, we would have three cameras at the price of one. And depending if we create slinky states from A, B, or C, principal rotation states, uh, we get to take snapshots of different sides of the molecule uh, with just one camera. Uh, and one particular case is quite interesting here, uh, the case of the B uh, uh, slinky state, where the electric dipole moment of this H2S molecule is aligned along the uh, wave vector of the pulse. Uh, you might also want to see a paper by Paul Corkum, uh, who uh, sort of pioneered this idea. Mm. So this is about imaging. Uh, there are some prospects, uh, possible prospects for, for using it in imaging. Uh, and, you know, one motivation to push the theory of imaging uh, regarding all this, what has been said before, uh, where states which occur at very high rotational excitations. So what would happen if we carried on with this rotational excitation up to very high J values? Uh, then a chiral phase emerges. And uh, this was exactly our motivation. Uh, so as we go along the rotational excitation, first we have states rotating about the A axis and then 
a new stable axis of rotation emerges. It's the axis aligned along the SH bond. And the other bond stretches, the C2V symmetry is broken. And uh, by orienting these states up or down, we create a pair of enantiomers uh, as the neural images are different. And these calculations were carried out with Richmond. Uh, so again, a big credit to Andrei Yachminev, Richmond's main developer. But uh, this was also a motivation to produce a code uh, which will at least try to image these states. And this is how Chiralix was born, uh, which sort of welds together the raw vibration wave packets with photoelectron dynamics. Uh, it solves the time dependent Schrodinger equation for the motion of one electron in external fields. <clears throat> and uh, we wanted to simulate the detection of dynamical chirality uh, of this dynamical chiral phase with this, uh, with this code, uh, thanks to the photoelectron circular dichroism technique. Uh, and in order to do this, we first track the uh, electron density, we convert it to momentum space, and then try to assess the forward backward emission asymmetry. Uh, but this is for another story. Uh, a PCD is uh, most likely not very suitable for uh, imaging these states because uh, these states are so-called falsely chiral. But this is, again, for another day. Uh, what I would like to show you is uh, what's the present state of this code. Uh, as I said, it, it solves the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for molecules. Uh, in arbitrary external fields, chiral, non-chiral, whatever fields you can imagine, it can calculate and produce electronic orbitals and uh, interactively plot them. It can track in time electron density. By Fourier transform, it can produce molecular frame momentum distributions of the electron, photoelectron spectra, including ATI peaks. It can calculate PECD as a function of molecular orientation in the, in the laboratory frame and all collection of laboratory frame momentum distributions, uh, which are evaluated based on these uh, probability densities obtained from the wave packets. So this is the joining point of the nuclear motion theory with the electron dynamics. Uh, it can also produce uh, some Legendre analysis, which is quite widespread in the photoelectron community and angle result emission rates. Uh, and this is my last slide, uh, which kind of advertises what might be happening next. Uh, this code is intended for use uh, in PCD simulations, essentially, but it can also be used in any, all other types of photoelectron time-resolved uh, imaging uh, simulations. Uh, with hope uh, into moving to tunneling uh, regime and, and simulating laser-induced electron diffraction or HAG. And advantages of this approach that uh, I'm showing is uh, that we offer non-perturbative large grid time-dependent Schrodinger equation solutions, no strong field approximations uh, employed. Uh, it models ATI processes, dynamical stark shifts, dynamical interferences in the momentum space, and it is probably good with Friedberg states. Uh, this is because we are using single center expansion of the photoelectron wave function. And we solve a set of partial wave equations. Uh, and this program is also coupled with Psi4 electronic structure package, which provides on the fly uh, the, the potential of the cation at any level of TU that you wish, and arbitrary fields. We can put in either initial orbitals, initial electronic orbitals from our calculations or from electronic structure package and project it onto our basis. Uh, and this is essentially it. Uh, future directions for the code is that uh, I would like to put spin into action and produce spin resolved uh, electron dynamics like spin polarization in PCD, for instance, and also couple it with nuclear motion. So like in the photo excitation circular dichroism, where you produce vibronic wave packets and it interacts, it interferes with the outgoing electron wave. Uh, so uh, if you have any uh, questions, I would be really happy to discuss it uh, after, after the talk. Uh, big thanks to Andre Yachminev and Jochen Cooper from CFL and DEASY 
also thank you to Philip Denekhin and Anton Artemiev for uh, very helpful discussions regarding the parallax code. And I thank you for, for coming today and, and for your attention. Uh, happy to answer your questions. Thanks. So thank you, Zach, for this really nice talk. Are there questions, comments? Would anybody like to ask something? So this code of yours, do you intend to make it available to the community? Or? Yes, it is going to be it is going to be available. It is on GitHub now. Uh, with additional funding, I hope to make it a release of this code in the future, if it turns out to be uh, successful in a way, in any way. Uh, so it's a pre-release version at the moment. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. But it was definitely a hot talk, and I loved how how uh, that uh, screwdriver, whatever it was, was turning. It's physics, but you would be burned for that a few hundred years ago. Yes, yes, definitely. I also have a model of optical centrifuge in my hands, so you can see how this pulse is is moving. So. Uh, this is another artifact of a wizard. Very good. I would now use uh, the opportunity to thank our two speakers for putting themselves up there and talking here to the community and to everybody. And I thank all the people who have joined and supported not only the initiative, but uh, the early career researchers here today in our area. So huge thanks and see you soon.